Okay, cool. So the purpose of the group study is the same as it's always been. We come together, we discuss our practice and like what's going on in our life experience and try to link the two together. I think it would be super appropriate to do some review though and just kind of outline T, you know, the complete practice and just really clarify on, on some things because that's definitely what I've been doing uh, a year, 10 months is just really organizing. And then there's some aspects to the practice that I needed to be evidence-based. And so I went out and I proved it to myself first, you know, and then the continued evidence is how well it works for other people, which is why I think it's important to share these things. Does that make sense? Hey, Jean, thanks for hanging out. Getting the band back together. It's nice. Look at this today. Take some notes. Uh, today is three. Good morning. How are you? I'm healthy. Excellent. Recovering from a fractured wrist, but other than that, we're okay. I saw that. <laughs> Gene, we only, we only get one wrist. No, never mind. We get two wrists. No, I get two. No, I'm learning to use my left. It's very challenging. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, the piano is difficult, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot about things to take for granted. It's amazing. Nice. It's good. Now, let's see. So if I do share screen, I don't want to show my desktop. This is an application now. What is this crap? Where's my uh, whiteboard? Did they take my whiteboard away? I have Chrome or you had some trouble finding it last time. I think you didn't have it. I wonder if it's just this computer. Because That's what you said last time, too. Yeah, because I'm using Chrome as the operating system. Mm -hmm. and so like I had to log in with my phone to start this meeting because it wouldn't it wouldn't let me retrieve the meetings, you know the reoccurring meetings or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs> okay, so I'll just take notes, and I see Donna is probably taking notes. I see a pen and a piece of paper, so I am putting those two together. And Jerry, you are a master note taker. So if, if you also don't mind just jotting a few things down, if you feel like it. All right, so we're just gonna do a quick review today. Moving forward though, I think it is a super good idea and I'm not gonna tell anybody what to do. I'll do it myself, but come to the group study with some examples or some questions about <clears throat> the practice, excuse me, let me mute this. I can just clear my throat. Okay, so when you come to the group study, you can either have some questions about how the practice relates to life experience, or maybe some examples of how you use the practice in relation to life experience. So one of the things I'd really like to focus on in the group study is the island of the practical. That's a, a really important one because our life experience is constantly changing and shifting and different things are, are constantly going on. So the group study will always be different in that regard. And then always the same because like Donna will point out the answer almost 10 times out of 10 goes right back to the very same thing. And I think that's, that's a really good thing. Yes, this is being recorded. And then I'll upload it to YouTube. And then I started a, a Facebook page for the group study and I'll upload it there. Or not, you know, I'll link it there so that you can see it. All right, so I'm gonna use some of my, my more technical terms in the review, just because I think it is even a little bit more clear when I use terms that I believe the academic community, they may not accept, but they could at least relate to it because I'm using terminology that they would understand. So the first thing, and it's one of the most important things, of course, is sensory attention training. The bottom line is that our experience is being perceived via sensory perception. So 
we perceive the world around us, it is assembled in our mind, and, and that's perception. We're perceiving what we're receiving. That does rhyme, and I didn't intend that, but that's nice. So we are receiving, and then the perception occurs, and there's a lot of things going on, of course. Human perception is the totality of your entire life experience converging on this one moment. And that's why we can all see the same thing, and yet none of us see the same thing, right? So sensory attention training is a fundamental core of what we're doing. So first of all, are there any questions about that? <clears throat> Why clear my throat? Yeah, so sensory attention training, we start with our five senses. This is basic stuff. We listen to the sounds of the world. When it's time to enjoy a meal, we really pay attention to different flavors. We pay attention to how those flavors interact and how it makes us feel. So that's an example. When olfactory senses, you know, really taking the time. So in Chicago where I work, and strangely, I just work right down the street from where I used to work. Like it's a city of 3 million people that's gigantic. And I, I literally just moved right down the street. It's strange, but there's a chocolate factory. And so when I come outside, I smell chocolate and it is nice. And that's not the usual smell in Chicago. Let me tell you, every now and then you just get that sewer whiff, but I walk outside and it's just the smell of chocolate. And remember my olfactory senses don't work so great. So that's a, that's an area of attention that I really put my, or a sensory perception that I really put my attention on. Of course, so we got the five senses, but we also have what I call introspective sensory perception. Introspective is we're going into the body. And that is a wonderful result of having what we call a, a peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> Dang. We're talking at this time. It's too early. I'm not used to talking at 6 a.m., I guess, anymore. So because of our peripheral nervous system, and we know this because if somebody is in an accident and they have a spinal injury, they lose body perception. There may be phantom things, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be phantom things, um, this, that, or the other, but in general, when a person suffers a certain type of injury, they can lose all perception of their body. So, but we, that hasn't happened to us. So we can sense into our body via the peripheral nervous system. And then we have this fun word that I learned. And I don't know if Donna remembers, but at first I was like, what, the, what is proprioception? I don't want to talk about that. That's a weird word. I love it. Proprioception is the foundation of hydrostasy. And hydrostasy, I'll, I'll, when I talk about that later, that's a part of the tea practice, but it's super optional because what I do might, like dreamwalking, that maybe a person isn't interested in that. I love that artistic edge of the world. I love looking at the world from, from that very particular perspective that just makes everything not good or bad, but it just emphasizes it, if that makes sense. And that's what dreamwalking is. But okay, so we have introspective, we have proprioception. I don't really think I'm missing any, but that, that's the gist of sensory attention training. Now, attention, we're putting attention on these senses. Training, we're learning to do it often. Eventually, we can learn to maintain deliberate points of attention. And of, of course, sensory attention training involves the three pillars. And the three pillars is, the, is what I would call the method. That's the everything that I, I have to share in this regard is centered around these three pillars. Presence, the ability to bring your attention back to the moment at hand, shining the light. And how do we do that? Sensory attention training. How do we bring it? What, I mean, what are we doing with our attention when we bring it back to the present moment? Well, it's not thinking. That's not, that's not, I mean, that's not mindfulness. So that second one is mindfulness. And I define mindfulness as the ability to be present without necessarily creating new thought streams about it. So when you're in a work setting and someone says, we need to be mindful of this, they're saying, we need to pay attention to this when the time comes. So if they're saying, be mindful of how you interact with this individual, I can't really do that before. 
That's not being mindful of my interaction with that individual. I can't really do it later because that's recollecting. I'm just reflecting on how I interacted with that person. If I want to be mindful of my interaction with the human being, that involves presence. Does that make sense? So we have presence and we have mindfulness. And ultimately, this is a mindfulness system, learning to be more mindful throughout the day. Eventually, if you so choose, embodying mindfulness so that you're mindful all the time in some degree, to some degree. Does that make sense? Pretty, I mean, this is old school stuff, but it's still nice to hear it all come together. And it's like, oh, all right, this does make perfect sense again. Where was I? So I talked about sensory attention training. Um, where was I? Oh, the three pillars, yes. And then, so, but how do we embody it? That's the tricky part. That's where I kept getting caught up. I'm like, okay, I understand to be present. I understand to be mindful. And I can do it for 30 seconds at a time. And then I would go right back into patterns. I would go right back into thinking and trying to control. And to some extent, those 30 seconds were still nice. I'm like, okay, like I, I'm still getting a taste of what is possible from that 30 seconds of mindfulness. So I knew there was something to it. I knew that there was something very important about being present and not necessarily labeling and judging and comparing and contrasting and putting everything into a conceptual box. I, I don't have to do that. And that's mindfulness. And then, of course, the thing that made me made it click for me was Don Juan. And Don Juan was trying to, and whether this is a fictional story, it doesn't matter. And of course, you all know that my interest in Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan is not yaki sorcery. I mean, that is interesting, but it's the techniques. He was giving him things to do to achieve a result. And I realized that that's what I was attempting to do. That's what I wanted to do. And I, I'm not trying to stop internal dialogue. That's Don Juan's terminology. I think that's completely erroneous. And I think that's just, it's still coming from Carlos's language because he's the writer, he's the author. So it's still coming from his mind. And that's why that language is so consistent. There's still a lot of control, manipulation, and a lot of violence uh, in, in the language. So the third pillar, I realized I wasn't doing anything with my mind. I wasn't doing anything to root me into the present moment, to, to hold on to the present moment. I would be present, I would be mindful, and then I would be a leaf at the mercy of the wind. And eventually I would end up right back into psychological suffering, sometimes 30 seconds later, sometimes even less. Maybe I got a good two or three minutes, but if, if I'm really paying attention to it, it wasn't much more than that. And that's what a lot of the yogis and teachers were recommending that I do. Just, you know, do your mindfulness study or do your yoga for 20 minutes a day and that will make everything okay. Nah, that didn't work. Five minutes of, of meditation will make everything. And I'm like, okay, but I got to do it for 40 years, you say, in order to, to have anything happen. So the third pillar is to maintain deliberate points of attention. A deliberate point of attention is best when intended in advance, especially when you first begin. So what I have recommended from the beginning and what you'll start to see in some of the study materials that I create, and the study materials are, I am telling you what to do. You know, you don't have to do this practice. You can go do jump rope for heart. It doesn't matter. Like if it, it works for you, the best practice is the practice you're going to actually do and stick to. I just happen to think this is very well-rounded and can suit anybody where they're at. So I think it's good. I think it's important. I think it has value. So the third pillar is to maintain, as often as you can remember at least, eventually the more that we practice, we do become present all of the time to some extent. We learn to maintain a low-hanging fruit. It's, it's usually that the lowest hanging fruit for that individual is the one that they'll start to remember the most often. Right? Breath usually ain't it. Trying to maintain your breath all day long with a deliberate nature usually starts to feel like force for, for some folks in the beginning. For other folks who've been practicing different, different practices for a while, they may pick that up right away. I don't know. Everybody's a little bit different. That's why I call them phases. 
and layers because it's not levels. We just continue to layer on top and those lower layers never go away. Those are initial layers, not lower. Initial layers never really go away. So if you maintain the deliberate point of attention, what I recommend in the beginning is to create a toolbox. Write that shit down. Write it on a piece of paper. And that's what the study material will be. Write your points of attention that you want to remember throughout the day, as many as you can write down. And you can alternate between them. It could be shadows. It could be the introspective. I'm going to pay attention. I have a new aura ring so that I can track my sleep better because it's the best sleep tracker on the market. And I want to improve my sleep. I want to see you know, where it's at and what can I do with it without manipulating and attempting to control, of course. But you know, maybe there's some little things that I could do, like not eating right before bed to help my overall sleep. So yeah, I mean, the, the points of attention, there's so many. But if we write them down, that is our toolbox. We can't hustle ourselves that way. So if Michael says, today I'm paying attention to shadows, I'm pulling that from my toolbox. And then of course we get into situational awareness, situational mindfulness. And so you may have different tools for that situation. We may have segmenting. At the beginning of the day, you may have certain tools. In the middle of the day, when you're at work, you may have certain tools. When you're trying to wind down for the evening so that you can get good rest and recharge, you may have certain tools. So our toolbox can be segmented, it can be situational, but it's predetermined in the beginning so that you don't hustle yourself. And it, and it will feel tricky. It'll be like, I have to do something, but it's, you're not really doing. There's, you're not really doing, you're directing the light of your attention where you want it to go. There is no subject and object. Gene has never had a single second of life experience without his attention, never. He cannot be separated from it and still expect to be called Gene, right? They can't, they can't be removed from one another for him to maintain the continuity of Gene. I can't remove my attention from my experience. It may not always be deliberate, but it's still there. It's still shining somewhere. The analogy I like is it's like a water hose that nobody's holding and it has full water pressure and it's just flapping all over the place, just shooting water everywhere. That's common attention. That's where, it, that's the attention of a mind that is habitual and in just unconscious patterns. What we've learned to do is just direct the water hose, but we are that water hose. So there's no subject and object. There's no manipulation. There's no force. There's no attempting to control. So the first one is sensory attention training. And let's say Jerry starts with sensory attention training. She's paying attention to the present moment. I, I used to think that interacting with thoughts was something that we had to kind of wait to do or that I didn't want to do right away. I just, I, I, don't, really, I don't really look at it that way anymore. I think the cognitive redirection technique, the T can be easily substituted with therapy because it's a form of therapy. Learning to redirect your thoughts begins with cognitive attention training. And that is, that is learning to watch your own mind, watch your own thinking as it's occurring. Some people may not really feel inclined to do that for whatever reason, and I get it, but I'll make it available on day one. So cognitive attention training uses what I call the redirection technique. I'm just redirecting my attention back to my my points of attention that I predetermined. Now, the way that I do that, and this is why I think the book is so important, I use my voice of power. I use the words in my mind to redirect my attention, and we call that the rule of three. That's a big part of the rule of three, remember? I have an internal point of attention, an external point of attention, and then I, I tell myself, it's going to be okay. Three o'clock is going to come regardless. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room, Ernest. You don't have to be the fastest person in the room. Just go in there with your confidence, do your thing, and everything will work out. Or you'll learn from it because it didn't work out, one or the other, or both, always. All right, so we have sensory attention training. We have cognitive attention training. We have cognitive redirection. And you can call that training or therapy. 
redirection, that is the redirection technique. And that involves the rule of three. This is all really basic stuff. Very clear and organized though. Donna, do you have any questions so far? Yeah, oh, well, I just wanted to say that um, what confused me, I don't know if it was confused me, I had a misperception in the beginning and it really took me a while to realize is that everything you just said something to do, something to focus on, your toolbox, your techniques, um, the definitions of all of them. I had a preconceived idea that I was trying to move from something bad to something good. And um, I couldn't really understand. I was looking for tools that made me feel good. And, and now I realize that just the being aware of the direction of your mind was a whole process. Just being aware of what you're doing with your mind was a layer. And then redirecting with any one of the tools was just the movement from unawareness to awareness. It didn't have to be from something bad to something good. It didn't have to be, oh, I feel joyful now, or I feel I am just taking some responsibility for the direction of my mind. I'm becoming the chooser and taking the whole good, bad um, judgment out of it was made it so much less of a struggle. It was, and, and you still had the effects. The effects are felt. The relief is felt, the um, peace, the, the direction toward peace is felt. Um, the whole process of just not being a leaf at the mercy of the wind was the process. Not good, bad, not joy, not peace, not bliss, not nirvana. Yeah, I just wanted to interject that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that like some of the modern things that we're seeing in, the, in this, I'm putting this in super duper air quotes, spiritual environment that kind of facilitated that idea that we should be going from positive to negative? Yes, or from negative but I think positive? also even in our own group, as a result of, of practicing for years, there is a, a lot of uh, things that I can judge as more desired and better as a result of doing it but in the beginning that's not the goal that's not the that's not the work the activity of just mind awareness and be and moving from a, a direction of unawareness or reactivity to choice was big and needed practice still does to this moment it still needs practice and just the movement from a less desired, less chosen place to a more specific, more chosen place has all the benefits inherent in it. It's not because I'm trying to achieve something. It's that thing is allowed because I'm doing it. So that's why all of the um, things that we mentioned, people would be like, why do I wanna focus on my breath? Why do I wanna focus on my feet? Like, what's so great about my feet? What's so, I don't get it. What's, I, you know, who cares about shadows? You know, it's not really, the, the tool is just a technique to become aware of the direction, the chooser of the direction of your mind. That's simply it. And all, most of what we talk about were different ways of doing it and making a game of it. And then the results are felt. I love that, making a game of it. And that reminded me of Gene and the doorknob because Gene decided to use a doorknob as a point of attention. And then in one of the study sessions, he's like, I don't know why I'm doing this. He's like, I'm just looking at a doorknob. I'm like, Whoa, where does the peace, the joy, and the love come from the doorknob? But you're, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would also mention, though, just, just for the sake of mentioning, you know, let's say, you know, Lisa is using a redirection technique that involves positivity. It involves going from something that is unpleasurable to potentially something that's pleasurable. I wouldn't say that that is an erroneous thing to do, right? It could still be beneficial if a person is like, you know, I don't know, positive thought, positive thought, positive thought, instead of whatever they were just thinking. That could still be beneficial, but ultimately Donna is, is right on. It's not about positive and negative. It's not about good or bad. It's about unconscious versus deliberate. Being a leaf at the mercy of the wind versus being the director of the light of your attention and ultimately your entire life experience as a result. Bottom line. Yes, Theon, yes. Because ultimately what 
is pleasurable or not pleasurable is going to be so individual anyway. It, it's it, we can't put them in boxes. Everyone's everyone's perception. It, like you said in the very beginning of class, we are here in this moment as a result of the totality of everything we've experienced. So no one technique is going to be the same for any two people. We might have we might. Um, discuss things that feel similar, the sense of relief when we've moved from one, a non-deliberate place to a deliberate place, or even to joy or peace or ecstasy even, but, but it's not, be, the tool doesn't carry any inherent value. It's just a tool. Right. Um, but with that said, I have actually started to locate techniques that do seem to have a little bit more of an effect, like a, um, a direct derivative from the technique. Uh, I don't know if I was going to talk about that today, but since, since you mentioned it, I've, I've put words to it finally, and I call it mind gazing. You could call it brain gazing, but it is literally shining the light of attention into areas of your own brain. And the, the way that I, I think I discovered this was from standing meditation. When, Lisa, when we do our standing meditation, remember we're taught to listen behind us. And so I'm listening behind me and my posture improves. I'm like, yes, okay. Like I don't, like I get it. I want my posture to improve. So I'm just like that, just, that must be it. You know, I want my posture to improve. I put my attention behind me, it improves. That, that's it. That's the only thing that's occurring. But then in some of my, you know, biology classes, some of my, the classes that I was learning about the physical brain, I'm like, I learned that our posture is controlled back here in our brain. And I'm like, so I'm putting attention in the area that's responsible for posture without, without doing that intentionally because that's not how it was instructed. I was told to listen. When you listen behind you, the light of your attention is going behind you. And so it ends up like almost shining that direction into your own, into your own brain, your own skull. <laughs> and it has an effect. Well, I was like, okay, that's interesting. What if I put my attention where thinking centers are or focus? And then, you know, we have some, some things that might be a little bit more esoteric in nature up here that, that hasn't caught on in biology. Well, it hasn't, you know, there's, there's no tangible thing there yet. They're still looking. But so when you put attention into different parts of your brain, there does seem to be more direct derivative from those techniques. And that could still be different for every person, but I think that in this regard, it will be more similar. So throughout the day, depending on what I'm doing, I put attention in different parts of my brain for different effects. So when I'm at work and I'm in a new environment, this is actually perfect with group study. Notice I, we, we're taking a topic and I'm gonna give an example. And then maybe you'll think of some examples. I don't know. This is kind of, we have never talked, we haven't talked too much about this type of things, but in general, that's how group study works. So I'm at work and I'm in a new environment. When it comes to food service, when it comes to a dispensary, I know all of the things in my environment in terms of sensory attention to help keep me aware and present and focused and a good worker. I'm sitting in an office now. There's no cameras anymore. I don't really have a boss looking over my shoulder. I can be late. I could take a two hour lunch. Who knows? You know, who cares? There's nobody watching. Well, I care. I want to be honest. I don't want to steal time. I want to stay focused and get good work done instead of surfing the internet. You know, I'm sure Shana knows all about this because she's been working at a desk for years. So she's like, okay, I already have these strategies, you know, to stay focused and to stay busy. Well, I started shining the light of my attention into different parts of my brain to help maintain my focus, help maintain my relaxation, to improve the quality of my work. When I want to focus on the computer, I use defocused vision, but when I need to focus on something specific, I put the light of my attention into the front of my head. And that's when I really want, like uh, we talk about de-arming a bomb focus. That's where I put my attention when I want to do my de-arming a bomb focus. I put my attention right there in the third eye and I focus in on it. And what do you know? And, and Donna, it literally could just be the same thing we've been talking about. Doesn't really matter what the technique, it, 
but it just really, I could just be hustling myself. <laughs> in you've terms always, of you've always said you put the attention on your throat when you have to speak a lot, when you're giving class. I'm, so I'm doing that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was, I had to talk on the phone. Our, my generation, I, the world is generally going away from phone conversations, you know, so I had to calm myself down. I had to put my attention on my throat and hi, this is Ernest calling from such and such in reference to your application that you submitted on Indeed. And my first phone call, I sounded like an idiot. Like, I, 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 I mean, it just, it wasn't clear. It wasn't, I said silly things and I'm just like, okie dokie, bye bye. And it's like, that's not professional. Like, who says that? So I just needed to make those adjustments and shining the light of my attention into different areas of my brain has helped me do that. Shining attention into my heart. So, the theory here now is there are certain techniques in terms of putting attention into different parts of your body that have a more direct effect. The dantian when you want confidence, the heart when you want to connect, the throat when you want to speak with more confidence, defocused vision when you don't want your eyes to go places that could make you feel unwell. Do you see what I mean? All right, so now some of the things that we have, so sensory attention training, cognitive attention training, cognitive redirection therapy, we've talked about all of this. And I think that we've talked about all of that in great detail. Some of the things I didn't want to touch on as much, but I'm open to now because I've, I've really ironed out the techniques and what it looks like and how I can deliver it is behavior. And I thought I had to have a PhD to talk about this, but I'm still just using the three pillars. So no, it's still not force. It's still not trying to control. I'm not gonna tell you what to do. So I'm not telling you a behavior that you should go do. So I don't have to take responsibility for that. But we do get into behavioral attention because I've been paying attention to my mind. At a certain point, I can begin to pay attention to my actions as well as they occur. Now the trick, and, and maybe this is a reason I don't want to talk about this too much in the beginning is because the mind in the beginning is still going to go back to patterns of attempting to control and manipulate because it's what it's used to doing. Does that make sense? Behavior, the way that I talk about modifying and learning to learning to have behavior that is more in alignment to your inspired desire, your intelligent desire. And I can talk about those terms later as well. But to have behavior that feels like it's in alignment, like it's in your personal power, this is what I want. But how do we do that without interfering? How do we do that without force and trying to control? And so that's some things that we could begin to talk about. Behavioral attention training leads to behavioral redirection therapy, learning to redirect your behavior in the moment as it happens. So in the beginning, we can create a baseline of inner guru, uh, the voice of power, which is productive self-dialogue, substitute dialogue. That is all learning to create your voice of power, your own inner guru. Inner guru comes in huge with behavioral attention because there comes a point where your inner voice says, Ernest, you're making this all about you right now. Ernest, this is just your biological destroyer. You don't need all this food. You're in the habit of overeating when it tastes good. That's okay. It is what it is. You've arrived at the totality of your experience, but there does come a certain time where I'm cherry picking if I just continue with that activity, but I don't wanna use force, I don't wanna control. And that involves redirecting my attention, redirecting my mind and talking to myself in a productive way, not beating myself up, not creating the multiplicity of self. That's why I don't say I'm getting better because that implies I was once worse. No, I'm just the totality of everything that I've ever done, learned, spoken, and there's in alignment and there's out of alignment. Out of alignment won't feel as, as good. It won't feel as empowered. That's a more specific word. 
Because if you eat a bunch of chocolate that you're in the habitual act of doing, that can still feel gratifying and good to a certain point. But it won't feel like personal power. And you'll, you'll be able to sense that. You know, this isn't, this isn't personal power. This isn't alignment. Alignment always feels like personal power. Intention and will coming from unrestricted energy. Energy that's just flowing smoothly. And this gets revealed to you. It's not something that you, you can think of in advance. You're in the moment, you're paying attention to your mind, you're paying attention to your thoughts, you're paying attention to a behavior, and you're paying attention to how it feels. So and you're paying attention to your yes. body. Yes. I'm sorry, it's just that, that sensory attention training, the basics, the three pillars, the basics. Uh, while you were talking about behavior, I notice that I am pulled into habitual eating the chocolate or whatever, wanting to control an environment, whatever behavior I'm involved in. I've lost that connection with my sense. Where's my feet? Where's my breath? Where's my, that takes over because I've, I've lost the other. It's much easier to see when I'm still practicing sensory attention training and all of the basics. That other stuff is, is uh, there's a space. There's a space for me to see it and choose differently if I'm engaged in sens sensory attention training. If I'm, not, if I'm not engaged in my body and in my senses, then, then I'm back to reactive behavior. No, you're absolutely right, which is why I use the term layers. So yeah, so that's implied. I cannot be aware of my behavior if I don't have my pillars in place, if I don't have my points of attention in place. If I'm in unconscious habitual mode, I'm not gonna see what I'm doing in real, in, in real time as the moment's happening. The best I'll do is quick recollection, and that's at best. The worst is no recollection at all, and I'm not even aware of my actions. Does it, so does that make, that's a, that's a perfect point. If I'm aware of my behavior, that's because I'm aware of my points of attention in the present moment. And that's, that's the basics. That's day one, the third pillar. Um, so that's a lot of review. I think some of the other terms that may be important are feeling. We love to talk about that word feeling. You know, we feel, we feel. So if you feel your body, that's introspective awareness. You're aware of your body via your peripheral nervous system. Otherwise, we're probably talking about our emotional state. Every person from the moment that they're conceived probably, I say probably because I don't have data to support that, but at least from when they're born, all the way until they transition to something new, they are experiencing an emotion. We, we are emotional beings. We're always in something. Depression typically is a word that we use for when we're not really feeling much emotion in terms of, of degree or variance. It's just very blah. It's just very mundane. And there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for that. So what I would definitely align to some of the later phases of the practice, some of the later layers, is being aware of our emotional state. Again, mindfully, because it's emotional mindfulness. That's the term. Emotional mindfulness leads to emotional intelligence. I would write this down because this is super important if, because this will be really ingrained moving forward. And especially that, that pattern of mindfulness leads to intelligence. Behavioral mindfulness leads to behavioral intelligence. Social mindfulness leads to social intelligence. Relationship mindfulness, and I'm putting this more in terms of like our coupling rituals or whatever you're into, that type of mindfulness to that type of intelligence. Intelligence is not the three parts of wisdom, or excuse me, knowledge. Knowledge has three parts, information, another person's experience, Gene could tell me that when handles are red, don't touch them. And I, I may not do that. I may not touch it, but then again, I might. And that will be the third part, which is my own experience. That's what I need. I need those three things to say, I know something. 
And it doesn't matter if I know it, if I forget and don't apply it unto wisdom. And so now we have that application unto wisdom. Does that make sense? So we're emotional creatures and a part of this practice eventually is starting to pay attention to your emotional state, how you feel states. That's always plural. No human being is just sad or just happy. We're multidimensional creatures who are experiencing a wide variety of biological, chemical, electrical responses happening all at once. This, it's so weird to just constantly put our, the totality of who we are in just this binary left or right. I'm either good or I'm bad. And that's why, and I found the quote, that's a side note, but I found the quote where I first started to do this, where I respond with, how are you, with how I feel. And people notice that when they first meet me. They're like, hey, Ernest, how are you? And I'm like, I feel fucking fantastic. Thanks for asking. And, and then they start to notice, like, you always answer with how you feel. What other answer is there? What do you mean? How am I doing? That's how I feel. That's how I'm doing. I feel great. I feel inspired. How, are, how do you feel? <laughs> Which usually, if it's 9 a.m. in the morning, they're like, it's my second Monday. You can fuck off. Some people don't like my shining energy, so I dial it down a little bit sometimes. All right, so we have um, emotional intelligence that comes from emotional mindfulness. We have behavioral intelligence that, oh, the reason I was uh, talking about that before is because intelligence is not knowledge. It is not wisdom. Not the way that I'm using the word, okay? I don't wanna say the way that you may associate to the word is wrong or the Webster de definition is wrong. I just wanna define my term so that we can communicate and we can work this practice together. Intelligence is when the mind is relaxed. It's when you don't necessarily know. Nobody's ever told you that something red hot can burn you, but intelligently you start to put your hand towards it and you feel the heat and you're like, wait a second, that, that might not end well. That's intelligence. You've never really experienced that before, but yet you're moving and you're adapting and you're in flow. Intelligent equal flow. They're, they're two of the same things. Does that make sense? Not IQ. No, I think IQ may have a place, but it's definitely not more important than emotional intelligence. Maybe not less important either. I don't know. I, don't, I, have, I have never really thought of it that way, but so the mindfulness, paying attention, this is so important though, paying attention without judging. People are judgmental, which is opinions. I'm thinking opinions. So if I see Gene and I start thinking about like the color of his shirt or his posture, or is it good or is it bad? I'm judging him. And we, people do it all the time. But what people do the most and, and, and it's not talked about as much, they judge themselves. They're constantly judging themselves, creating the multiplicity of self, my better self, my shadow self, my upper self, my downer self. I don't see that. I see the totality of my entire life experience, every word, every choice, every atom spinning, converging to this moment now. And it's so multifaceted that no one word, two words, sentence is ever going to be able to encapsulate it entirely. Labeling, categorizing, conceptualizing. It has a place. It does in this world. It's important to be able to conceptualize. That way I can tell Gene that anything that is burning red hot and creating heat will burn you, not just the pan. We can communicate that. We can categorize that. Words and concepts are great for communication, assuming that they're clear, <laughs> clear concepts. And that's pretty much what we're doing. So as we move forward, I will very likely refer to these terms such as emotional mindfulness. Am I aware of my emotional state? Social mindfulness. How am I interacting with other people right now? One thing, and I'll, I'll give examples. I'm at work and I really wanna make sure that I'm listening because this is a new environment. I have to go into an office environment in 
supreme learning mode. So I have to clear my mind and pay attention. Listen when people talk to me. I've noticed that by doing that, I have follow-up questions. I ask about, well, what did you mean by this word? Because I, I, I don't really, I'm not really connecting with it. That's a part of my social mindfulness. Am I listening to a human being? Am I hearing them? Or am I just, again, thinking about my own thoughts? And if I was, my inner guru says, Ernest, you're just making this about you. That's not leaking power. That's, a, that's occurring. I'm making this about me. That's not leaking power to just point out what's occurring and then redirect it. Does that make sense? And then so some of the things that I have proven to myself recently is the direction of attention is the direction of everything. Everything flows in that direction. I, I can do anything I want in this world. I think the one thing I've learned over the course of, of, of these classes is I can't do it all at once. That's the thing that's been the hard lesson for me. I have so much that I want to do and so much that I want to share and I can't but I don't have the energy or the resources right now to just do it all instantly. And so I've, I've learned that. I have to pay attention to that. I have to remind myself of that when I'm trying to do a hundred things at once. But, and I don't, I don't want to go into all the details. I'm sure that we'll review it as I give examples, but yeah. Conscious creation is a direct result of the direct, direction of attention. That's it. And everything that Abraham Hicks is teaching, anything that Napoleon Hill is teaching, anything that any law of attraction, well, not any, <laughs> that could get into a slippery slope, but it's all going to involve deliberate attention. If it doesn't, we're not talking about the same thing. There is no conscious awareness occur. All right, so with that said, we any questions about these categorizations and what does your practice look like? I mean, we don't have to jump into it now if you don't have anything ready, but I do encourage you at least in, in the group studies to have, if you want, you know, if there's something going on, this is the perfect time to seek clarification. What are we doing with our practice? I will have a hundred examples. I should, I'm not, I'm not Buddha. When I see things happening around the world, I feel an emotion. That emotion is the result of my entire life experience converging on this moment. It's, it's fine. I don't have to judge it. I don't have to label it. When I look at an, an atrocity occurring, I don't feel good about that atrocity. I've been able to observe that. I don't need to know where it came from. I don't need psychotherapy. I don't need methods of force and trying to control, but I need to be sure that I don't go down cognitive rabbit holes and start violating all of my principles. My reaction is my reaction. How I feel is how I feel. I don't own an, an explanation to anybody. I tend to give explanations because I don't mind. But I don't owe it to a soul. I can, I can do me. So that's just an example of, of things that we could talk about in the group study moving forward. But now's the perfect time. I have about 10 minutes left. Do we have any questions? Anything that you'd like to know? Any clarification of your practice, encouragement? Anything like that? And that's okay if we don't have a lot. We haven't gotten together in a while. I get it. Yeah, I have something. I hear it. Yes, go ahead, Gene. Yeah. I, I found that um, lots of time has passed since, uh, since I joined the group. And um, I find that, that um, I, I have the same issues. I mean, they're defined a little differently, but uh, it seems it comes down to the same thing and it's, and it's forgetting. It's just forgetting to direct the points of attention. Even though I uh, make a list in the morning, it, two hours later, I'm into something else and I, don't, I may not remember it for quite some time. Uh, hours, perhaps that might take hours, and that and that seems to be happening for for quite a long time. So I, I've come up with a couple of other things. 
more basic, I think, than it, it might be similar. Uh, you'll have to tell me. Uh, I, I divide the day, seg segment the day into hours. And I try to find, or I notice, or I make sure that in every hour I have found some event, some site, some thing that brings me joy and peace. And I stay with it for as long as I can. And then I get on with the rest of my life. And then I check in again and I go, well, oh, gee, 45 minutes has passed and I haven't, I haven't found another one or I forgot again. So I have to, I, it's a, maybe it's a forcing issue, but I say, okay, now it's, now it's time for me to pay attention again. And I, I find another. And I have been lucky enough to be able to almost every hour find something that I can stay with. Um, and the problem is sustaining. That, that has been my problem, sustaining. So I can sustain for a minute or two, sometimes for 10 minutes I can sustain. And, and then it's gone again. And I have to remember, I have to remember again later on in the day. So sometimes I, I do it 10 times a day, sometimes 20 times a day. There are days that I do it three times a day. And my, my and I see the value every time I do it. I find the value every time I do it. Um, I feel better. I feel peace. I feel calm. And, and I consider, I, I, I wonder um, if I feel so good about it when I do it, how come I forget to do <laughs> every, I get involved in whatever it is I'm doing and then I'm gone. And, and um, so I'm, I still work. I still work on that. Um, I still, I, I, it's the place I found myself for the last two or three years. I recognize uh, directing my attention, but remembering is, is always been a challenge still. Anyway, that's my comment. That makes perfect sense. Um, let me check the time. We do have time to respond to that. Um, it's so there's a couple of keywords. So I wasn't going to ask a couple of questions, but you you just answered them at the end. How does it feel? You know, how how is doing what you're doing? How does it feel? Is it contribute? And you answer that it is contributing. It does feel good. It does, you know, feel powerful. So I think. One of the things, if, if we were really going to look into this, I would want to make sure that we're not leaking power in other, other areas. So first, let's tighten. Let's just make sure that's not occurring, that at no point during the day are we getting down. Believe it or not, creating the multiplicity of self is, leaking, is a form of leaking power. So the more I talk about my future self, my shadow self, my infinite self, my non-infinite self, my, my broken self, my bad self, my evil... All these different selves is a form of, of a slow leak of power. Does it? So if that's not occurring, one of the things that no, that's a current. No, that that is a current. That is a current. Okay, so that needs to be re redirected. That's using the rule of three. Uh, and if that doesn't occur, we can't gain the momentum necessary to create the sustaining. So the momentum is intention and will. That's personal power. You gain personal power anytime that you're intending and willing. If you're leaking power, you're not, you're not really, that's not a part of your conscious intention and will. You said, why? Well, we've gained momentum in another direction. And that's okay. That's why you don't have to judge yourself. I've gained momentum in some areas. And you've gained momentum in these areas. And Donna has some in some areas. The core is the same. The root is the same the branches end up being very different for each of us based on our life experience. Not better, not worse, not good, not bad, not, you know, before, not, it's all happening now still. So first, leaking power has to be redirected using the rule of three as often as it's occurring. When that is plugged up, when the, when the power is no longer just leaking onto the floor, we start to gain more personal power momentum. The intention and the will really starts to pick up. And the only way it becomes sustainable is by remembering to practice. And as Donna has pointed out for years, if we're remembering, that's a win. 
and we're coming from forgetting every time that we're remembering. And when you read my, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'm going through my book again and I'm just checking every, every T and every I and making sure everything is in place. No perfection, but I just want to give it my due diligence. And I, and in the book, I, I was, I'm saying exactly what you're saying. I'm talking to my own inner guru. I'm like, I just, I can't maintain this. It just feels so daunting to even think. It feels so daunting. I'm starting to leak power. I'm, it feels so daunting. It feels so I can't do this. What I'm, that's a form of leaking power. And so, no, I'm not going to gain momentum and sustainability from that. So my first recommendation would be pay attention to the leaking power without judging, without controlling. It's not your fault, though it is. It's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, your, it's society. It's the momentum of the human species. It's a lot of different things that have contributed to this particular momentum that isn't really serving us. It's not really benefiting us, but it has gained momentum because that's how momentum works. It accumulates. We have accumulated the momentum of unconscious action, unconscious behavior, where the light of our attention isn't deliberate. I think that's very common. And that's the why. So you know why. The voice of power can remind you of why also. It's okay. You know, there's so many factors going into this, but I have to redirect it using my, my techniques. Uh, so the more, I, I think the segmenting, by the way, is, is great. You know, that's working for you. It's reminding you of your practice. And the reason it feels good is because it was a little mini burst of intention and will. You intended to do it every hour. You did it. It has all of the principles of the practice involved, and that will feel better. We're creating some space. And if we can plug up the holes of leaking power, we'll start to gain a little bit more momentum of personal power, and that will lend to the sustainability of learning to hold a point of attention. That's kind of the before and the after of this practice, really. So my focus then, uh, I understand what you're saying. My focus then is... Uh... Let's start with the leaking power and recognizing when that's happening. Absolutely. Um, and redirecting yeah. it using the rule of three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can recognize it as it occurs. Mm -hmm. And the um, recognizing of the leaking power is a win because once you notice it, then you turn you redirect and the process of redirecting has as much value as finding things to enjoy and you know it, ha it's, it has its own intrinsic value that can be felt yes it's not like yep. oh yeah i remembered that i'm an ass so now i got to go back to not being an ass and do the things that feel good it's ah look what i'm doing Look at that. Yeah, but I'm never I've I'm noticed. Never that doesn't happen. No, no. I, I use my own word there. Um, and I was, I was relating to myself only, of course. Um, when you notice, ch just, just changing that to a win is, oh, look, I noticed, I noticed I'm leaking power. Like that is a win. It's like plugging up a hole in a dam. And I just mm -hmm. really... I just understood that for the first time. I, I mean, I know that that occurred and I've spoken about it before, but I've never really saw the direct relationship between momentum and, and leaking power, but it really is uh, connected. Yeah, thank you for that <laughs> question and answer. Oh yeah, no, infinitely connected. Yeah, it's the, we took a step and, and, and you gave a perfect example of the difference between the voice of power and then going into leaking power. Because the voice of power will remind you of what's occurring because you already know. And maybe your voice of power is very kind and says, Donna, you're doing it. That's just an observation. You're doing not it. Not the Angolia voice of power. The Angolia right. <laughs> voice of power is not kind. No, mine isn't either. And that's okay. It is what it is. But so the voice of power will say, Ernest, you're doing it. That's just a fact i'm doing it but we start to leak power when we go to you're doing it you're never going to get this like why okay i gotta do better i gotta do better starting monday there we go again so it's it's 
a very fine line, but a very clear line between the voice of power and leaking power. The voice of power is just going to tell you what's occurring. You already know, but the voice of power is just reminding you, Ernest, this isn't benefiting you. And right now you have a choice. Redirect your mind using the rule of three, redirect your behavior using the voice of power and the rule of three, or continue doing what you're doing and accept it, move on. But the more that you have created space and momentum, what doesn't serve you won't feel good. You'll see it. That's what I call seeing. You'll see that, wait a second, <laughs> stealing a lot of money is benefiting my, my financial statement, but it's making me feel like a shitty human being. So I can feel that now because I'm starting to come into alignment with everything else. All right. That's what we have time for. I did record this and I'll upload it to YouTube. Just keep in mind. And of course, I'm not, this isn't a part of a, a course or any, we're just doing group studies. But if you do speak in the group study, you may end up on YouTube. So just keep that in mind. I had some folks and I can understand. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, then maybe write your questions down. You can keep it Zoom user and things like that. I think that's 100% awesome but I will upload this just so that people can reflect on it later and it can be beneficial to others. All right, if you have any questions throughout the week about some of these you know, phrases that we're using, some of the acronyms, the layers of, of practice, you can just send me a, uh, a message and we could talk about them more in the group study. And if you don't wanna voice your question in the group study, send it to me and that will be one of the topics I bring. And I will always have examples because I'm doing my practice to the nth degree. And I have, and this is the way that I talk about it, Gene. I have a lot of smooth areas in that pond of earnest in, in the pond, the, the puddle, but there are some rough areas as well. And I just use the word rough areas because the energy doesn't flow like I want it to, like I know it can in certain areas because I'm not Buddha. So I'll be able to talk about the things that I'm smoothening out and we can talk about the things that you're smoothing out and it could be beneficial, such as my new work environment. There'll be a lot of stuff about that. All right, so I will see, I'm very glad we're getting together again. The big thing was my schedule starting at nine. I, ha I have a whole extra hour in my morning. So what better way to spend it at least one day a week doing this? That's a good idea. All right, so I'll see you next Thursday. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out. I will probably start to share the link so folks who are interested in mindfulness and you know they want to see what we're doing and see how it can benefit them I will invite people this one I didn't really do that just because you know I didn't <laughs> all right well I will see you guys again next Thursday for sure uh, but yeah reach out to me if you have any questions comments I'll upload this to YouTube so that you can review it um, and if you need like a transcription of the notes just reach out to Jerry <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wouldn't want to hear her spirits. Great to see you all, all right, again. Bye, Ida. Yep. Bye. Good to see everyone. Have a good rest bye, of your day. Buddy. And enjoy your Thursday. Where's the end? Okay.